I'm here to talk about mind control as a user interface designer. And mind control is interesting because ultimately mind control is about behavior control. And as user interface designer, behavior is the business that we're in. And I want to argue that uh, not only do we have techniques that allow us to control behavior, and not only is it good as a user interface designer to have this technique in your toolbox, but I want to argue that it is our obligation to do so. As you hear, I'm going to be talking about design, first and foremost. But my uh, little niche of design, user interface design, may not be very well known. So I'm just going to start by talking about design in general. And when many people think about design, they think about graphical design. And here are a few exquisite examples of graphical design. These logos may inspire with you um, trust, or that you might dislike them, or you may like them. But what is, um, but what they don't require is that you have any input in them. They can stand just as they are without you doing anything, except admiring them. Another type of design is industrial design. And the industrial design is all about function. And function is where the user comes in, where people do something with the design. And the design isn't complete unless somebody is actually doing something with this. These objects are very beautiful. They can stand as, as eye candy, but first and foremost, they were created for somebody to do something with them. Another type of design which takes this interaction even further is architecture. Now, this is an exquisite example of architecture. This is the Opera House in Sydney. You recognize it, of course. When the designer made it, he was not only thinking about creating this object that is the building. He was also thinking about how do we fit the orchestra and the stage and how are the singers going to come on stage and leave? How are the audience going to come in, check their coats and come into the auditorium? And if nobody would do this, this would probably be the silliest and most impractical warehouse in any harbor in the world. Because the building was not the primary objective. Creating the opera house was the objective. And the opera house is not only the building. And now we're coming closer to this little niche of design that I, I like to sit on, which is user interface design. User interfaces cannot stand alone. If nobody is using an iPhone, it's not an iPhone. User interface design is all about thinking about how a person with some gadgetry in his hand can do something. And that design is all about thinking about how the human being and the technology come together. So the user interface is that thin line between the user and the technology. And the user interface designer is the person that controls the communication between the two. That's the person that decides beforehand, even when he knows that he's never met this user, he's never going to meet this user, he knows how to uh, set up the interface so that the user will do exactly what he needs to do in order to succeed in what he wanted to do. And the only way a user interface designer can do this is by recognizing that both sides of this equation here are predictable. The technology is, of course, predictable because we designed it, we know what it's supposed to do, but the person is also predictable. Arthur C. Clarke once stated that any sufficiently advanced technology is undistinguishable from magic. And I especially like this statement because, of course, it is. When you have a gadget in your hand and you do something and it has an effect, it feels like magic because you cannot fathom in any sort of way all the technological details about how this came about. So it should feel like magic. 
But I want to make a distinction between the Harry Potter kind of magic and the Darren Brown kind of magic. Darren Brown and his colleagues are bound by all sorts of limitations that Harry Potter is not. For example, the laws of physics. So when Darren Brown pulls a rabbit out of a hat, he does so not by conjuring it out of thin air. He does so by careful preparation and by understanding exactly how to play the audience. He knows exactly how people are going to react and he knows exactly how to make them believe that the rabbit actually sprang out of the hat. And this is why Darren Brown at the outset of every show says, what I'm going to, what you're now going to experience is a mixture of showmanship, suggestion, psychology, misdirection, and magic. Now, this is what Darren Brown and his colleagues have come to understand. People are very predictable, and he can, they can play on it. And that's what I'm suggesting we do as well. Because when I say that we are predictable, I'm not saying that we are predictable in the same sort of way that The Economist said that the market was predictable because we all behave rationally. Just imagine their surprise when they found out that we didn't. <laughs> I'm saying we are predictable in the same way that psychology says we are predictable because for the better half of last century, psychology has been studying humans, human behavior, human perception, and they've come to find all sorts of patterns and all sorts of ru rules that are underlying this. So I'm saying that we are predictable in the same way that this guy is predictable. <laughs> Not only do we know what he's looking at, we also know that he can't hear a word that she's saying. <laughs> What he's experiencing is what we call visual dominance, which reminds me. Okay, welcome back, guys. <laughs> what he's experiencing is what we call visual dominance, which is basically a name for the fact that for, of all our senses, we mostly rely on our vision. We rely on it so that when we're sitting in a train and then the next train starts moving, we believe it's our train even though there's no hint from our bodies that we have started moving. We believe our vision first and foremost. And that is an example of what we know about perception and be human beings that we can take advantage of when we are designing. And I'm going to go through a couple of more examples uh, just to, to show you what we know. We have very bad memory. We have such a bad memory that we can't even be relied on to remember a phone number from the point that we look it up until we want to punch it in. Now this is the reason for why this user interface, the command line user interface, never got really popular. The command line user interface demands of the user that he remembers every command to get where he wants to go. And you can't expect that of anybody except an expert. If you want to uh, make computers uh, usable for the general public, you have to rely on the graphical user interface because the graphical user interface leaves you clues. It, it relies on recall much rather than, uh, re no, recognition much rather than recall. So you don't have to remember exactly how you do things. You just have to remember just about where you start and then you're going to be led on towards what you want to do. We make biased decisions. It's a very important point. <coughs> By biased decisions, I mean that our decisions can be influenced. Um, we, there are certain rules of thumbs that we use that uh, we have recognized, and they can be influenced. So these, uh, uh, these uh, rules of thumb that we're using are very understandable because they um, help us in making quick decisions. And that is very important to be able to do that. But for this guy, for example, there is only one door. 
he doesn't have to make a choice. And this is a, a bias we call the salience bias, which means that anything that sticks out, we tend to believe is more important than things that don't. Another bias here is that we, uh, we are not really good at understanding numbers and visualizing them. So it's difficult for us to understand how much bigger 90% is from 10%. So it's much easier to do it this way. And as soon as we uh, realized how much bigger 90% is from 10%, then we can emphasize that. And we can use that to make a point. Or we can use that to sell something. Even though 10% fat is, is really not really that healthy. But 90% fat free is good, right? <laughs> We make mistakes is probably the most important thing to realize as a user interface designer. Because as soon as you realize that, you realize that your software not only needs to lead your uh, user all the way through to success, the software also needs to catch the user as soon as he strays off that yellow brick road. And that's why the undo function is the most popular function <laughs> in any software. And if you can't undo, then please stop the user. Make him think, do you really want to do this? Is this what you want to do? Last but not least, we are lazy. And when I say that we are lazy, I mean we don't read instructions. I mean we go for the default. A user flows through a user interface like water, the path of least resistance. Okay? And that's what Dan Ariely was uh, pointing out to us when he said that if a selection has been made for us, we're not going to undo it. If this is ticked, um, I'm going to leave it like that. Because if I were to untick a selection, it means that I actually have to read this. <laughs> also means I have to understand it and I have to form an opinion about it. And that's just too much work. <laughs> I'm going to leave it like this and continue with my purpose, which was creating the account. And I'm going to hope that it doesn't come back to bite me. <laughs> but sometimes it does, because designers, of course, know this and they use this. They use the, uh, this. Uh, um, bias of ours to, to make us sign up for things that we didn't want to. And that's another important lesson to realize. We shouldn't make people do something that they didn't sign up for doing. What we do as user interface designers is that we help them do what they want to do. Um, here's also a very interesting little bias. We tend to group things together. That's why you see three columns that are, vertic uh, that are horizontal here but vertical over there, okay? Even though there's no difference between the bubbles, there's no difference except in, in a few pixelations and the distance between them. And they're all the same. Not only do we think about them as different, we think, we assume that there's a re relationship within each column. And that is why anybody who comes up voting for this ballot, with this ballot will of course punch the second hole of the punch card when he wants to vote for the second candidate on the left-hand side. <laughs> I've been talking about um, designing for users and how we can use what these, uh, this information from psychology, this research, that, I mean, this isn't news, I'm not telling you anything new. This is decades old research, what I'm trying to uh, argue here is that we should use it more systematically in order to lead our users through the user interface so that they can get to success. Because that is how, how we lead people's behavior. And we lead people towards success and I want to maintain that this is not only something that we do um, because it is our job to do so, I think it's our obligation to do so. As user interface designer we lay that red carpet that leads the user through the uh, gadget that he's using through words to success because when he's taking up your product to use it his goal is to succeed with it he's told you already okay I want to do this please help me get there and not doing it is like standing at the outset of this labyrinth going I know the way through here but I'm not gonna tell you <laughs> because I found my way through and I mean of course you can too, unless of course you're stupid or something. <laughs> and frankly, that's just rude. And if we've all been lost in this maze, and that doesn't make us feel good. Because 
the way we feel about ourselves is defined by the way that we make successes and failures in everyday life. And when more and more of our, what we do is bound by in, interaction with some gadget, then being lost in this maze makes us feel bad about each other. And that's why every year in Finland they hold a mobile phone throwing world championship. <laughs> because people are so frustrated with their mobile phones. They're so frustrated, they're willing to hurl <laughs> a gadget that they bought and that they need hundreds of meters just to demonstrate how angry they are. <laughs> and if you make a user do this, you have made his world worse. You have had a bad influence on that user. So you should take the obligation to lead him by the hand and not leave him wandering around the maze. And if you do that, you created a better world. <laughs>